Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. What an amazing and wonderful God you are. You fill this place with your presence. Fill us with your spirit. and Bring us into a greater place of awe and wonder of who you are. Thank you for this time. Thank you for loving us. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Diane and choir, thank you for that hymn. That's one of my all-time favorite hymns. I'm not sure how you picked that today, but I am thankful you did. Where are you? Do you ever play the game hide-and-seek? It's one of our favorite games to play with our grandchildren. And each one of them plays the game in a different way. Jack loves to play the game, but he just can't take the suspense of hiding and quickly starts to talk and give us clues to where he is so that we find him quickly. And here is a picture of of our two-year-old Eve who enjoys playing the game, but just hasn't quite grasped the concept of hiding yet. But she does make a lovely statue, though, doesn't she? (laughs) Today's message is about searching. Where are you? The message is based on the gospel that we heard earlier from Luke 15, verses 1 through 10, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Have you ever heard the question, have you found Jesus yet? Well, Jesus isn't the one that was lost. We are the ones that were lost. We are the ones that were lost and needed to be found. First, for salvation, and then on an ongoing basis for transformation and sanctification. So in this account, Jesus is going about his ministry here on earth. Tax collectors and sinners are drawing near to him because they sensed that he was a safe person to hang out with and to be with. And tax collectors and sinners in that day represented the low of the low at that time in that uh, frame in history. So the Pharisees and scribes who saw Jesus was allowing them to hang out with him got offended by that and they started to grumble and complain. A typical response for one who is inflicted with a religious spirit. Now a person with a religious spirit is one who is long on legalism, short on grace, and quick to judge. Those are typical characteristics of someone with a religious spirit. And Jesus answered their protesting with three parables. The parable of the one lost sheep out of the hundred, the parable of the one lost coin out of the ten, and the parable of the prodigal son. And we will look at the first two of those parables today. The first one, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So Jesus is that good shepherd that is always looking for us, his sheep, in his flock. And so the shepherd, watching over his sheep, noticing that he's missing one, he will willingly let the 99 by themselves and go off looking for that one lost sheep because he knows that the 99 are basically safe in group. Their safety in group numbers. But the one would be very vulnerable. The one would be vulnerable to attack by a, a wild animal or might get caught in a thicket and get trapped and can't get free. Sheep are pretty helpless, kind of like we are sometimes. Now this lost sheep likely wandered off by itself under its own power, its own choice. Um, It made that choice to do that. It wasn't somebody that pushed it away or excluded it. It chose to go off and do things its own way, much like we do. Where are you, lamb chop? Come on, where are you hiding? I need you, get you back here. Much like we do when we choose to walk away from God and do things our own way, neglecting the better life that he has for us, 
the better way of going. But God seeks after us. God is always seeking after us because he has better for us. Just as a shepherd continually looks for that lost sheep trying to find it. Where are you hiding, lamb chop? I need you. Oh, there you are. Aw, come on back, precious. I missed you. God continues to look for us because he knows that different ways, different people come to hear his voice. And so he seeks us out in different ways to let us know that we are wanted, that we are loved. And God doesn't, looks for us not because he doesn't know where we're at. He knows where we are. After all, he knows everything. But he's searching out for us, for our benefit, to know what is best for us, to help us to recognize him. Stick around here now. <laughs> to come and know that we are loved by him. To come and join the security that there is with him, just as the lamb is much safer with the flock. And when the lost is found, there is great joy in heaven. Just as for the shepherd, there is great joy and peace of knowing that the 99 are 100 again. Now you stay here. Be safe. Now many rabbis in Jesus' time did not believe that God received the sinners in the right way. For them... They thought that God should be making sure that they all got cleaned up and confessed and repented and were in the right order before they should be brought back in. But that wasn't the way for God. Like the shepherd looking after the sheep, so God looks after us. You know, Jesus taught that God actively seeks out the lost. He does not grudgingly receive the lost. Instead, he searches after them. And when God finds one sinner, there is great rejoicing in heaven over that. Jesus, praying in John 17, asks his father that his disciples would be in the world, but not of the world. And he also prayed that we would be protected from the temptations of the world. So as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called and gifted to be disciple makers for the kingdom of God. Now the emphasis in this parable is on the joy of finding the lost. This is the air of the Pharisees and the scribes who complained because they were not joyful to see the tax collectors and sinners seeking to be reformed or seeking to come to Jesus or draw near to him. But that's not the case for heaven. There is great rejoicing over one sinner who repents. Now clearly, the lost sheep can't repent. So that's where the message comes for us, is that by the love of God, we are called to repent and move into repentance. Luke chapter 12, verse 32 speaks to this. Fear not, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's the heart of Father God, is to give us the kingdom, to bless us, and make our lives richer and more full. Now the second parable, or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that was lost. Now the woman who has lost a coin lit a lamp, and swept her house looking for that coin. Well, she probably didn't have an LED flashlight like I have. So you just kind of have to imagine that this is just a lamp. And a woman, she would need an extra lamp because typical in those days, the houses didn't have windows or they had very small windows. And so she would need extra light if she was going to look for a lost coin. Do you have it? Is it in your pocket? Nope. Where is that coin? And the lost coin here represents a person 
who has been led astray by maybe a false teacher or incomplete doctrine, they've been acted on by an outside force. A coin can't go off and get lost on its own. And that's what happens to us sometimes when we hear false teaching or get misled, that uh, we get lost in that. And once again, God seeks us out. God is looking for that lost coin, trying to find out where it is. Where can that be? And God seeks once again for us to know that we are promised, that we are valuable and precious to him, and that he has good and great things for us, better than what we can dream or imagine. Oh, there it is. I don't know how I lost this big coin, but... (laughs) And again, there is great joy in heaven when the lost is found. The woman finding her lost coin calls in her family and friend and tells them, um, come and celebrate with me for what was lost is now found again. Once again, that rejoicing in heaven. You know, we often don't picture God in that way as rejoicing or celebrating, but yet there are multiple passages in scriptures that tell us that God does rejoice in heaven. He does celebrate And here are a couple passages that talk about um, how God does celebrate and the circumstances under which he does that. First one is in Isaiah 62, verse 5. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Or a favorite of mine, Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is in your midst. The Mighty One will save He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. This is not the stern, critical judge that a legalistic person would portray God to be. Rather, Jesus in these parables is portraying his Father, Father God, to be a God of love and compassion who wants the best for us at all times and in every way. Now, personally, I can identify with a legalistic person as well as one who has been setting free. As a recovering Pharisee, I can readily identify with some operating from a legalistic point of view. For many years, my church life involved a list of rules and regulations that needed to be followed exactly. There would be checklists and things to be completed every day so that from my perspective is that I wouldn't be in trouble with God or I wouldn't be in trouble with the authorities over me. And the focus in all this was on me and what I could do and not on the relationship with God or with a loving father or a loving God. So, as with any good Pharisee would do, I expected those around me to toe the same line of performance. Not very loving. A clear case of misery introducing misery all in the name of serving God, or so I thought. And that's a classical way that if you look at the Pharisees and the scribes in the New Testament, when Jesus' interaction with them, that's what the main thing that he spoke to them about, letting go of that. But God. Then God intervened in my life, first with love and then with grace. Prior to this time, I believed that God loved me. Intellectually, it made sense. It was what I was taught. It's what the Bible said. And so I professed that to be true. However, I didn't have the heart knowledge. I didn't have the relationship. I didn't see God as being safe or the love of God. But once I experienced that love of God at a heart level, oh my, was my life changed. I was transformed. There is no going back now. I would never have it any other way. So much of what I was searching for, the questions that I had, had been answered or they just didn't seem to matter anymore. Jesus changed me from the inside out. Now, there are still struggles and there are still challenges in life, but they don't have the same impact or the power they had on me before when I was operating by my own power instead of now relying on the power of the Holy Spirit and upon Jesus Christ. 
And now, because I know that I am loved unconditionally, I was assured that my life would be spent forever, and that would be in the presence of a loving Father. John chapter 5, verse 24, became very meaningful and powerful for me and during that, at that time. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. In this passage, I saw that eternal life begins immediately upon receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Not when we physically die, but immediately. When we spiritually die to self and come alive in Christ. And then there is grace. That unmerited love of God made available to each and given to all who receive it. Now one doesn't even need to be a disciple of Jesus Christ to receive the free gift of grace. After all, it's by grace that we are saved in the first place. So God pours out his grace on each and every person, people who lived in the past, people who are living now, people who are living the future. God pours out their grace on him. It's the loving kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It is that loving kindness that pours that grace on us, whether for the first time for salvation or the umpteenth time for forgiveness, transformation, and sanctification. So what we do with the free gift of grace is up to us. God doesn't force us to accept or to reject it. He doesn't force us to accept or receive or reject Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The choice is ours to make, to reject or to accept. Do you still have unsaved areas in your life? I know that I do. And the good thing is the Holy Spirit out of kindness and love, brings those to the surface to help me see what those are so that I can deal with those and bring those to the cross. Not to shame me, not to condemn me, but rather that I can live in greater victory and wholeness. And that's part of the good news is that God always has better for us. He's always working in us and through us to bring about greater revelation, greater freedom, and greater hope. So it's the love and grace of God that leads him to search for that missing lamb or for that lost coin. To search and to seek out each and every one of us and to provide us with a means to live a life of victory. It is also that love and grace of God working in us that enables us to join God in what he is already doing in our community and beyond. And there is no greater calling for the disciple of Jesus Christ, but to partner with God to bring an eternally dead person into eternal life, raising them from the dead. We get that opportunity to do that when we share the gospel. So I would encourage you to ask Jesus every day to show you the divine appointments that he has set up for you for that day. And then by the power of the Holy Spirit to accept that invitation, to keep that appointment, and do exactly what he leads you to do and empowers you to do. And when we pray and act in obedience to how God is leading us to share the good news, to, to give a helping hand, to be the gospel with our actions as well as with our words, we can have great confidence in knowing that we are acting directly and completely in the will of God when we do that. And I want to just leave you with that promise in Matthew chapter 18, 18, verse 14, that says, So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should ever perish. God desires that all would be saved and come into relationship with him. Let us pray. Lord, you are a merciful God. You are a God of grace a God of love, a God of compassion. You have better for us than we can dream or imagine. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to receive more and more of what you have. And Lord, if there's any here today that have not yet accepted you as their Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that they would, this very day, would not hesitate but say yes to you, knowing that you came to seek and save the lost. 
And for each of us that are disciples, Lord, that we would desire greater intimacy with you and leave behind the things of this world that block or hinder that relationship, that your kingdom would be ever expanding in our sphere of influence. Praise be to you, God. Thank you, Lord. So I invite the ushers to come forward this time to receive the morning tithes and offerings, and let me pray over that. Father, thank you for your generosity, your goodness, your provision, that you provide us with everything that we need and beyond. Help us to be generous, giving back to you, and that your kingdom would be ever-expanding. Amen and amen.